Hey friends, thanks so much for tuning back into another Great Commission Alliance Media Channel Bible Bite. Today we are going to be continuing our series on Ephesians, looking at chapter 5 and the life of Christ. What does it look like when Christ lives his life through ours? If you've ever realized that certain things that we're called to as Christians are hard or even impossible in our own strength, this chapter gives us such encouragement because we realize that through the Holy Spirit and as dearly loved children of God, we can let Christ live his life through ours. And that will impact every area of our lives. That's coming up in just a moment. All right, well, before I jump into the text, let me give you a little bit of a review. So far, we've done four Bible Bites on the first four chapters of Ephesians. We've looked at number one, the sufficiency of Christ, then number two, the work of Christ, then number three, the gospel of Christ, and then number four, the body of Christ. Today, we're going to be looking at chapter five, verse one, through chapter six, verse nine, and the focus today is on the life of Christ. What does it look like when Christ lives his life through ours? In the next Bible Bite, we will wrap up with chapter 6 and the victory of Christ. Let me give you a little bit of an outline for today's Bible Bite on Ephesians chapter 5 through 6-9. We're going to be looking at following Christ's example. Then we will look at living with Christ's power. And then finally, growing in Christ's likeness. All three of these themes are right in our text today. So let's go ahead and look at the first one. The first one is following Christ's example. And this covers the first 14 verses of the chapter. I'm only going to read to you verse 1. So let's go ahead and read verse 1. Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children. You know, dearly loved children love following their father's examples. Here is a picture of my dear son, Micah. It's a couple years old, but it's a picture of the two of us fixing a toilet here in the house. Micah loves me, and I love Micah, and because he is a dearly loved child, he loves to do what I do. This is just one example of it. But it's like this for believers as well. When we know who we are in Christ, when we know that we are loved infinitely by God, it will cause in us a desire to imitate him, to live Christ-like lives. See, we can live his life through our life, through his power, but it starts with a relationship with God that is worked out daily in fellowship and love with our creator. And that's what it's talking about here. Paul begins this chapter talking about being dearly loved children of God and imitating God. And then he gives us a little bit of a picture of what that looks like. And this kind of sets us up for the rest of this chapter. He talks about a few important things. Imitating Christ. That's a pretty tall order right from the start. He talks about loving him. He talks about loving others. Of course, remember what Jesus said, that all the law can be summed up in loving God and loving others as ourselves. Jesus is telling us in Mark 12 that we must love God first and others like ourselves second. And Paul reiterates that here in this passage. We have to love God and we have to love others. And he continues, though, and he talks about walking in integrity, walking in the light, honoring God in our lives, not getting into things that would destroy our witness or pull us apart from our brothers and sisters. And then he talks about pleasing the Lord. Imagine living your life in a way that pleased God in every way. We're commanded to do this throughout Scripture, and we're reminded of it again here in these first 14 verses in Ephesians. So we see here that we are to follow Christ's example. Verses 1 through 14. The next point, though, in the next section, and this is going to cover verses 15 through 20, is living with Christ's power. See, all that stuff from the first 14 verses is important, but I can't do it on my own. I'm going to read you what I think is the key verse here, and this is verse 18. And it says, Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. Wow. 
You know, when somebody drinks wine, it causes them to do things and say things and think things that they might not otherwise do or say or think. Likewise, when we are filled with the Spirit, we are going to act like the Spirit. We are going to think like the Spirit. We are going to talk like the Spirit. And this is the life that we're called to, a Spirit-filled and Spirit-filled life that looks like Jesus in this world because it is His life being lived out through ours. Now, if you're confused about being filled with the Spirit, let me just ultra-simplify it here. Ephesians 5.18, this is a command to Christians, and it's an ongoing command if you look at the Greek. And this ongoing command to believers is one that each of us ought to obey. So God calls us to be filled with the Spirit. He also promises us in 1 John 5, verses 14 and 15, that if we ask anything according to his will, we'll have it. So here's my challenge. If you wake up each day and consciously surrender your life to the Lord, asking him to fill and empower you with his spirit to do his will, I promise you he's going to honor that prayer because he promises that he will because it is in line with his will. Okay, what does that look like? Well, we're called to walk in his wisdom in this passage. We're called to walk in his will in this passage. We're called to walk in his power in this passage. And those things will be true of every spirit-filled believer. J. Oswald Saunders describes the spirit-filled life this way. To be filled with the spirit means simply that the Christian voluntarily surrenders life and will to the spirit. Through faith, the believer's personality is permeated, mastered, and controlled by the spirit. This is something that we can walk out each day by faith. It's not by trying harder. It's simply a decision by faith to trust him and to surrender to him and to make ourselves available to him to be used as he pleases. Maybe that's to share our faith. Maybe that's to encourage someone. Maybe that's to give to someone. Whatever way he chooses, we've surrendered and we are allowing him to use us. We are at his disposal and we are consciously surrendering to his spirit who then empowers us to live Christ's life on this earth. So the next point in this chapter is what does that look like in some of the common areas of our lives? Growing in Christ-likeness. Let's read just Ephesians 5.21, but this is going to be out of the passage that covers verses 21 through 6, verse 9. It says, Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. There you go. If Christ is my focus, he is going to be causing me to submit to others out of reverence for him, to put their good above my own, to love him and out of love for him, to love others enough to elevate them in my life. And what's that look like? Well, Paul goes on to talk about how that looks in marriages, husbands and wives reflecting Christ to the world because they are consciously submitting to each other out of reverence for Christ. They are allowing the Holy Spirit to live Christ's life through them in their marriage. And that's displaying Christ to the world. How does that look like between parents and children? We see here an example of godly parents and godly children honoring each other and reflecting Christ, empowered by the Spirit to live out these roles that they have in this world. And then we even see what that looks like in employer-employee relationships. We see here about slaves and masters, but the terminology here in today's world could literally be interpreted as employees and employers. And here's what I want you to understand. Whatever your career looks like, it is set there by God as a place for you to honor him. It is your great commission calling. So honor him in your workplace. If you have a boss, honor Christ in such a way that it will point your boss to Christ. If you are a boss, honor Christ in such a way that it will point those you lead to Christ as well. So here we see in Ephesians 5, the life of Christ lived in and through us as we simply follow him, loving him, and allowing him to work in and through us through the power of his Holy Spirit. You can't do this on your own, but the Holy Spirit in you can. And he is absolutely 100% committed to this process in your life. Hey, maybe you don't yet know Jesus and you don't even have the Holy Spirit I'm talking about. You don't know what it looks like to live your life in a Christ-like way of love and humility and forgiveness and peace. You don't know what that looks like. And you don't have confidence of where you stand with God. You don't look at him as your father. You don't know with confidence that you're his son. If that's you, I'm talking to you right now. 
please take a step of faith today. Say, Jesus, I believe that you are who you say you are, that you died on the cross for my sins and rose again to give me eternal life. Please be my Savior and Lord. If you took that step today, go to growingwithjesus.com. That's growingwithjesus.com. Hey, and if you know Jesus, that's my challenge. Live this life through the power of the Holy Spirit so that he can do what only he can in and through you. The life of Christ lived out in your day-to-day activities, in your day-to-day relationships, and in every area of your life. Hey, if you haven't yet subscribed to the Great Commission Alliance Media Channel, please do that right now. Thank you so much for watching. We'll catch you again next time with the victory of Christ.